Well, I, I was there. I went to Stockholm twice and Oslo twice and Helsinki twice and, and, and Copenhagen once in the last month. And I spent quite a bit of, there was a lot of interviews um, and a lot of discussion about the so-called gender paradox. And that's a very interesting thing because it's really put their tails in a knot in Scandinavia. And, and that makes sense because the Scandinavians are going to have to deal with this first because they've gone the farthest down the road for like making their society gender equal. Yeah, but explain that to people. Yeah, if they don't, might I will. I will. Right. Okay. So, so imagine, first of all, that there's two kinds of equality that you might pursue. One would be equality of opportunity. And so that would mean that, um, you know, there's, there's wide range of talent across people, regardless of their type, whatever that might be, sex, gender, race, ethnicity, there's, there's talent distributed everywhere. And it's a kind of a truism, and I would say a, a truism of the West in the deepest sense that each of the individuals within those groups should be put in a position where they, their talents are, they're encouraged to manifest those talents, partly because that would be good for them spiritually and psychologically, but also because that would be of obvious benefit to the community, right? I mean, talent's rare, which people don't understand. There's lots of different kinds of talent, but, it's, but in each domain, it's rare. And so it's to everyone's benefit to exploit talented people to the maximal possible degree. So even if you're just selfish, you'd want to push for equality of opportunity because the more talented people there are out there, the more cool stuff you get to have. And hopefully the, the, the more diverse and interesting your life is. So, so you can pursue equality of opportunity um, policies. And the Scandinavians have done that, especially trying to knock down barriers t for women in the workplace. And by all accounts, by all standard theories, the Scandinavian countries and places like, like, like the Netherlands, Canada, too, to a slightly lesser degree, um, have, done a, have gone farther than any other countries in pursuing those um, policies. Okay, and, and, and part of the consequence of that is that some of the differences between men and women have been um, minimized. So obviously there's far more women in the workplace than there were 40 years ago. And in many occupations, there's actually dominance by women. There's dominance in the universities, there's dominance in the healthcare fields. And so women have poured into the workplace. And hypothetically, there's problems with that because it's put a lot of stress on family structure. But hypothetically, that's for the best. And because it gives people a broader range of choices and it gives everyone access to more talent. So, and then also, if you look around the world, you see that one of the best predictors of, of the probability of economic development in developing countries is their attitude, is the attitude in those countries towards equal rights for women. And it looks causal. The more positively the country is predisposed to female rights, the more likely they are to develop economically. And maybe that's because that indicates that they're open to new ideas or something like that, or open to transformation. So... Okay, so that's one kind of equality. Open up the playing field so that everybody has a chance to compete and cooperate and land, and land where they will. But then the other kind of equality is equality of outcome. So, and that's often described as equity in today's language. And so the ultimate equity utopia would be take every job, every conceivable kind of job, and then stratify that by every conceivable level of authority within every job. And then ensure that every single category of person is represented in precise uh, proportion to their, to their prevalence in the population. So every job should be 50% women and 50% men and say 13% non-Western ethnic minority and whatever that happens to be. And then you could break that down. And so, and otherwise there's evidence of systemic prejudice. Okay, now, first thing to say about that is that's impossible. And the reason it's impossible is because there's no limit to the number of ways that you can categorize people into groups. So, you know, you, you know about sex and ethnicity and race, maybe those are the obvious ones, but now you have gender and then you have ethnicity and, you know, and then there's attractiveness and intelligence and temperament and, and, and height and age and, and, and socioeconomic background. And I mean, let's say there's 20, but th there's a lot more than that. There's no possible way that you could ever regulated society so tightly that every single 
one of those groups was equally represented in every single one of those occupations at every single level of the hierarchy. That right, is impossible. So they impossible. want to concentrate on the significant ones, which well, are men and women and race. Well, yeah, but who's to say right. those are the significant ones? That's the other thing. I, it isn't even obvious that they are, because I would say that like a more significant one is cognitive ability, because that's a way bigger predictor of long-term life success than sex or race. So I don't even think that we've necessarily identified the canonical groups. We've just decided that gender and race are the, maybe they're the most obvious. Right, but isn't there a problem is that people don't, that what, what they don't do is they don't take, in, in terms of cognitive ability, they don't get on a team. They don't get on, like, there, there's people that are sexist. Yeah. But there's, it's very rare that someone is elitist in terms of their cognitive ability. Well, hard to say, Joe. I mean, I think one of the reasons that... Oh, I shouldn't say elitist. Prejudiced is a better word. I don't know. It's, it, I mean, it, you could be right. But look, I think one of the reasons that... Like, if you... Here's something that's kind of Actually, peculiar. doesn't even make sense now that I'm thinking about it. Of well, course they are. It's, well, there's one thing that's quite peculiar about the United States in that regard. is like most working class people, let's say, are far more irritated with the intellectual elite than they are with the wealthy elite. And that's because they think they could become wealthy, and they could, but they don't think they could become part of the intellectual elite. And it isn't obvious to me that the intellectual elite, so those would be the liberal left-leaning types that dominate the media and academia, are particularly um, positive in their, in their attitudes towards the typical working class person. I think they're prejudiced and elitist. I do believe that that's the case, and I think they're also... Um, what would you call it, patronizing. And I mm -hmm. think that the typical working class person, say, who voted for Trump is very, very sensitive to that. And so they're much more concerned with the 1% who are the cognitive elite than they are the 1% who are the economic elite, because at least they think that's a game they could play. So anyways... It, but anyways. isn't that also because there's caricatures, right, of the 1% the of the economic elite, you just think of people that are in these lofty positions that are in control of the financial institutions, but the 1% of the intellectual elite, you think of in terms of like some of the more preposterous things you're hearing out of universities now and safe spaces and... Oh, oh yeah, there's that too. Yeah. And that, there's that too. The there, things that, there's that no, well, yeah. there's no appreciation on the part of the intellectual elite for the pathologies of rational of, of rationalism. Right. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing stupider than a smart person who went wrong. You know, like you, you can tank on, I've, I've seen this in my clients, you know, frequently, like if I have a particularly smart client who's particularly disordered in their personality, that, that's just, that's often just, that's so difficult. It's almost unimaginable because they're so, so good at rationalizing, for example. About when yeah. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what is your approach to handling something like that? Who's like who's super intelligent, but yet completely their life is in disarray. Well, you know, I'm, I, usually, I usually take a very practical approach. Like, you know, we try to identify, because I, I start always in my therapy practice, I always start with behavioral principles. It's like, okay, well, let's see if we can identify a few areas, you know, through negotiation that are really causing you grief and misery. You know, like what's, what's wrong with your life as far as you're concerned? And so that often takes a lot of discussion. And then we might try to figure out what's causing that. And that's often very difficult to figure out too, because it might be, Geez, it might be something physical. You know, you might be sick in some way because depression is, lots of depression is autoimmune related and, and anxiety can be a side effect of all sorts of physiological disorders or eating improperly or sleeping badly or, or not exercising, you know, enough to, to kind of keep yourself regulated. So you try to figure out what's, what's causing it and then you try to sketch out some possible solution that we could both test. And then with the, with the, uh, with the more intelligent ones, you know, often they can come up with all sorts of reasons why none of this is going to work or, or a thousand reasons why, yeah, well, usually a thousand reasons why none of this is going to work. And that with people like that, sometimes it's useful to turn to their dreams if, if they dream, because one of the things that's cool about dreams is that even though they're hard to interpret, they never lie. And so sometimes you can take someone who's hyper-rational and they'll have a dream and they'll tell you the dream, and then you can work through an interpretation, which is a tricky business. And the dream will tell them something and there's just no denying it. It's like, well, it's a statement from nature. So what are you going to do? You're going to pretend that that's not the case? You know, so, so that's, that's often extremely useful. So, so, okay, so well, back to the equality issue. So, mm -hmm. okay, so here's what's happened. 
So psychologists have, and this is what's putting a tail, not in the tail of the Scandinavians, psychologists have come to a pretty decent agreement about standard personality models, right? So there's extroversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, openness, and conscientiousness. And they look fairly stable cross-culturally. And that was all done by asking thousands of people hundreds and hundreds of questions and then grouping them statistically. So it was atheoretical, basically. It took computational power and statistics to, to find out that these are how traits group. So um, inextroverted people are sociable and happy and neurotic people experience a fair bit of negative emotion. So that's the positive and negative emotion dimensions. Agreeable people are maternal and disagreeable people are competitive. And there's a fair bit of male-female difference there. Conscientious people are dutiful and industrious and orderly, and the open people are creative. And so those are your basic five dimensions. Okay, so that's been established, and everyone more or less agrees on it. Now, maybe there's seven dimensions, and we, we've got a questionnaire that, that, that breaks the five down into ten. That's called Understand Myself. Um, but, but basically, there's good, there's good consensus, consent consensus on the five. Okay, so now, as soon as you have the five basic traits, you can ask some questions like, well, do men and women differ? And so what you do is you just give the questionnaire. You can either fill it out yourself or have other people fill it out on your behalf. So, and it could be a teacher, it could be a parent, you know, and, and that's all being done. And what you find is there are systematic differences between men and women. And the biggest differences are that women experience more negative emotion and that, and that they're more agreeable than men. So, and that's borne out by the psychiatric evidence because um, higher levels of negative emotion are manifested in depression and anxiety and women are diagnosed with higher levels of depression and anxiety all around the world. And with agreeableness, that's also borne out by the clinical literature in some sense, the medical literature, socio-medical literature, because disagreeable people are more likely to be incarcerated because it's the best predictor of being incarcerated, even though it's not a very good predictor. And men are incarcerated at about a 10 to 1 rate compared to women and are more likely to be antisocial and conduct disordered. So the personality differences are mirrored in the socio-medical literature. Okay, so, the, so now, so there are differences. But then there's a question. Are those differences a consequence of socialization or are they biological? And the answer to that is tricky because how much something is social and how much it is biological actually depends on the social circumstances. So, well, here's an example. If you have a society where no one has enough to eat and people are starving, then there's a huge cultural effect on people's intelligence, let's say, that's mediated by economic factors, even though it's got a biological origin, right? The, the starvation. So, the relationship between biology and culture is actually partly culturally dependent, so it makes it complicated. But in any case, here's how the scientists decided to address this. They thought, well, why don't we rank order countries by how egalitarian their social policies are, which you can do with a fair degree of reliability. You know, you put the countries where women are second-class citizens at the bottom and you'd put the Scandinavian countries at the top. You can get good reliability across raters for how you'd rate those countries. And then look at the magnitude of the differences between men and women by the egalitarian social policies. And so then you'll find out, and here's the hypothesis. If the differences between men and women are primary, primarily social, then as cultures become more egalitarian, men and women will become more alike. That's not what happened. The opposite happened. The, the more egalitarian the society, and it turns out the richer the society, because that's also being discovered now, the more different men and women become. And so the differences are not huge. So with agreeableness, for example, if you took the average man, if you took a typical man and a typical woman out of the population, just randomly, and you had to bet that the woman was more aggressive than the man, you'd be wrong 60% of the time. So there's quite a bit of overlap, right? Because you'd be right 40% of the time. But the problem is, is that a lot of selection takes place at the extremes. Maybe you're only concerned about disagreeable people when they become violent. And maybe it's only the one in 50 most disagreeable person who's violent. And they're all men. So you can have quite a bit of similarity at, at the average level and big differences at the extremes. And the extremes is where people do things like, like uh, employment selection. So 
The biggest difference that's been discovered between men and women, and this is the one that gets biggest in the Scandinavian countries, is interest. Men are more interested in things, and women are more interested in people. And it's a big difference. It's one full standard deviation. And so what that means is that if you are a man, you would have to be more interested in people than 85% of men to be as interested in people as the 50th percentile woman. And you'd have to be more interested in things than 85% of women to be as interested in things as the typical man. And what do you, how do you define things? Objects? Gadgets. Okay. Gadgets. 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 Oh, things. Okay. Non, non, non-animate things. Cars. Car, yeah, yeah. Tools. Yeah. yeah. You know, mm-hmm. technology. Right. 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 STEM fields. Yeah. Because the other thing that's happened is that the more egalitarian the society, the fewer women go into the STEM fields. Mm. The fewer that's interesting. It, yeah. Okay. So, so now this unravels in a big way. It's like th- th- this is a hugely uh, relevant issue politically because it means that you cannot have equality of opportunity and equality of outcome at the same time. It's not possible because as you make your society more egalitarian and you open up the opportunity for equality of outcome, you increase how different men and women are, are and that changes their occupational choice. So if men are more interested in things, which they are by a substantial margin, then way more of them are going to be engineers. Wouldn't that possibly support this idea that an enforced model of of, of equality would allow people to be themselves more? I mean, this is almost what you're saying. Well, that that is that is the optimistic viewpoint. Like, look, well, look, it's so funny because the Swedish foreign minister told me to go climb back under the rock that I came out from under when I was in Scandinavia because I was describing this these this this science. I read that, but I'm I'm not exactly sure why. Well, she regards me as misogynist because I think that there are, because I think, because I've been putting forward the evidence that there are genuine differences between men and women. But she should be held accountable for that because that's just a flippant thing to say. Like you you, you should have, especially in a position of power like she's in, you should have a very specific argument. Saying like for a leader, to have such a, a base thing to say, such a, a crude, dumb thing to say, crawl back under the rock that you came from. Yeah, well, I thought she was what making the... a joke about lobsters, but I don't think she was. <laughs> the ro- lobsters go under rocks? I guess they do. They're growing cracks. Yeah, yeah and the bigger I... lobsters have better rocks. That was another very interesting thing in the GQ yeah. thing, where the woman was uh, challenging you on your neurobiology, your neurochemistry, oh, yes, yes, your yes, understanding yes, yes. of Well, hardly, lobsters. hardly any, hardly any uh, uh, psychologists understand that serotonin is associated with hierarchies. It's like a tree. It's been known for 30 years. So. We, we can definitely get back to that. But I, I'm, I'm, yep. I'm very curious about this because yep. this idea of uh, enforced equality, right, I- ensuring that there is uh, such a, a high emphasis played uh, placed on equal- equality that you have the equal amount of men, the equal amount of women, and the opportunities are absolutely available as much to women as they are to yep. men. This is enforced. Yep. That this creates an environment where there's less resistance. Now, in an environment where there's less resistance, perhaps women don't feel as compelled to say, I'll show you. Yeah, that, that How, is what seems to right, happen. This is the, well, well here's an, look, here's an example. So, there are fewer women mathematicians in the, in the higher echelons. Okay, but here's something interesting about mathematical ability. First of all, it's very rare, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. Now, it looks like, if you look in junior high, that give mathematically gifted men and um, males and females are approximately as common. Now, there's a little bit of debate about that because there is some evidence that maybe at the very upper extremes, there's a male advantage, just like there's a male disadvantage at the low end because the male distribution for intelligence might be flatter. And so that's the greater male variability hypothesis. There's been papers putting that forward that have been retracted as a consequence of pressure from politically correct people, Mm. even though greater male variability is actually quite common in the animal kingdom for a variety of reasons. Men are more expendable, that males are more expendable in some ways, or you could say that males are more likely to produce pursue high risk, high return strategies. You can look at it either way and it's certainly possible. In any case, the men, the males in junior high who happen to be mathematically gifted are less likely to also be verbally gifted. Whereas that doesn't seem to be the case for the females. And so if you're a male math nerd, then 
math is a pretty logical pathway for you because you don't have as many other options. Whereas if you're a female math nerd, you have other options because you're all, you're less likely, you're more likely to also be verbally gifted. And so that's enough to, at least in principle, account for some of the reason why there are fewer women mathematicians than men mathematicians. They have other you options. Know, they have other options. And there's lots of complex there's lots of complex reasons like this, and so we have this reflexive idea, and this is very much the case, because this is like the core idea among the feminist neo-Marxist types, is that if there's differences in outcome, that's, that's proof of prejudice, and that's support for the idea of the patriarchal tyranny, and that's like the core axiom of the radical left is the patriarchal tyranny, as far as I'm concerned. That's that's God for them, the patriarchal tyranny. It's like, well, if it turns out that many of these differences in outcome between men and women aren't a consequence of the patriarchal tyranny, in fact, even get bigger when you reduce the tyrannical aspect of the patriarch and even the patriarchal aspect to it, then it, it makes that theory not only wrong, but opposite of the truth, which is the worst kind of wrong. And so, you know, if men are more likely to pursue, pr pursue careers in the STEM fields, which seems to be the case, under conditions of optimal freedom for men and women, then that's going to drive income disparities because the STEM fields pay more. And they pay more partly because they're scalable. Like, it's really hard to scale care for people. You know, like if you work in a daycare, you're going to care for three infants. You're not going to care for 50 because you can't. It's not scalable. But if you're like a software designer, it's infinitely scalable. And so there's, there's a much wider range of, possible, of possibility for generating much larger, much larger income pools and much larger pools of wealth. You know, and men are also more likely to work longer hours. And if you work 10% longer hours, you make 40% more money. There's a nonlinear return on. That's a good thing for everybody who's listening to know. If you have a job, you want to be the guy or the woman who's working that extra 10% because the return on that is nonlinear. So that's a really useful thing to know. Men are more likely to work outside. They're more likely to work in dangerous businesses. They're more likely to run full-time businesses rather than part-time businesses. And uh, they're more likely to move in pursuit of their career goals. And that all contributes to differences in, and, and in, in among Uber drivers, they make 7% more money because they drive faster. So... And so anyway, that's so the, not good though. <laughs> well, but, but, well, no, but it's a high risk, I, I it's a high risk, saying. high return yes, issue, right? It's, I mean, it's a pattern male, the yeah, um, it's, common, it's, it's more risk. Pattern. There's more risk in yes. it. So there's more return as long as you don't get hurt. Right. And I think that's a pretty common male pattern is there's more risk is there's more return as long as you don't get hurt. The problem seems to be when discussing these things in, in any way, uh, romanticizing or uh, glorifying male behavior or putting any emphasis whatsoever on there being a, a positive aspect to a lot of the things that we think of as being negative, like mm. aggression or mm. ambition mm. Or, or, this, yeah. or competition. And yeah, like, yeah, well, the competition th amongst men is fine. Yeah. Competition with men against women is often thought of as cruel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, th 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 yes, well, and, and, and there's a certain amount of reason for that as well, because obviously physical competition is, it's easy for that to border on cruel. This is why we were, ta we were talking before the show hmm. that instead of calling people men and women when referring to like, because there's, there's this, very disturbing, in my opinion, trend of transgender women entering into mm -hmm. these competitions now with women who are biologically female yeah. and dominating them. Yeah. And that instead of calling people men and women, let's dispense with yeah, that. Yeah, you can be a man just, or a yes, woman. Just yeah. Say and, <laughs> yeah, you can be a man or a woman. That's your choice. And you can change it whenever you want. So you're a man or a woman, that, yep. and that's your choice. But we're going to have a new rule, which is that if you have an XY chromosome, so you're an XY person or an XX person, then if you're an XX person, XY person, you don't get to engage in physical combat with an XY person. Yes. Men or women. XX person. Doesn't matter. Yes. Yeah. How would yeah. that be? If you're XY, you can't engage in physical combat with XX. That's right. XYs yes. cannot hit XXs. How's that? And maybe they can't... Um, run in con running contests against them and maybe they can't yes. play tennis against them not yes. within and maybe that's just reasonable 